Okay, hello, I'm Dr. Pamela Payne Foster, and I'm delighted to be a part of this beloved community lecture series of Tuscaloosa. Uh, I'm a preventive medicine public health physician, so I thought what I'd do is give you a little overview of the public health um, overview of COVID-19, coronavirus-19, but I also, uh, as a researcher, do a lot of work with churches and faith-based uh, communities. So I also wanted to entitle this, The Church's Response to the COVID-19 Pandemic. So as I said, um, we're talking about this word pandemic, but what does that mean? Uh, I thought what I'd do is give you a couple of other um, definitions, and this is a simplified version of what we call epidemiology. Epidemiology is the study of epidemics. So an epidemic is really any disease that affects a large number of people within a community, population, or region. Um, so, and this is over time, okay? So we're talking about disease cases over time. Um, if you talk about recent epidemics here in the United States, the opioid epidemic is an is a, a epidemic that's occurring just here in, in the United States. If you make it larger, um, it becomes a pandemic. So a pandemic is an epidemic that's spread over multiple countries or continents. So now our biggest example currently is COVID-19, coronavirus-19. It is now what we call a pandemic. Endemics are anything that is seen in a, in a place that is always there. For example, if you go to uh, travel to Africa, malaria is there as an endemic sort of disease. And then an outbreak is a little different from an epidemic. It's a greater than anticipated increase in the number of endemic cases. Uh, for example, there was an outbreak of dengue fever in Hawaii. It doesn't usually see dengue fever. That's usually seen in some uh, uh, Central and South American and African countries, but they had an outbreak there. So that's what we call an outbreak. So it's really kind of important to really understand these different definitions as we look at the COVID-19 or coronavirus-19. The COVID-19 stands for, CO is for coronavirus, uh, the V is for virus, and the uh, ID is uh, for uh, in, uh, in disease. So COVID-19 is the, the 19 is when it was founded in 2019. So that's where we get that designation. Why is COVID-19 so devastating? Um, so for one thing, like I said, it's new, just founded in uh, 2019. We don't know a lot about it because it's new. Um, so we're really still learning. Um, even it started uh, uh, the, uh, in China in, uh, in, in November 2019. We're still learning about it. We're still really learning about how it's transmitted. Um, still not a lot of information, but we do know that it's droplet airborne. We're not still learning about how long it stays on surfaces and those types of things. The other reason why it's so devastating is, unlike a lot of other uh, infections, it has a long incubation period. Usually uh, uh, when a virus hits, is uh, we, we know we can a person has symptoms and it's in between three to five days. This one is, is up to 14 days. And the other part of it, besides being a long incubation period, is that it can go, uh, a person to be asymptomatic without symptoms. So that makes it complicated to know who has it and who doesn't and to really stop the uh, spread. So that's really why we're having so many problems with COVID-19. The other issue is we don't have any cures for it and we don't have a vaccine um, right now, usually a way to kind of control um, diseases and we don't have any treatment as well, which is another uh, complicating factor. So that's why you're seeing so much complications with this disease, including death. Um, how are we trying to uh, control the, the pandemic, this pandemic? Well, of course, you need leadership at the national level, because if you're talking about it being in an entire region, uh, an entire globally across uh, several countries, you have to have leadership um, that really understands those public health uh, ways to, um, to stop and control diseases, and they have to enforce laws to really help um, people understand that. You also have to have a really good public health structure, 
with resources, and I'll get back to this in a minute. The only thing we have right now is what we could do from a public health standpoint. And you also have, have to have widespread engagement of communities to really understand and, and really, uh, in, in our case, with a dem democratic society, um, participate in those, um, um, those um, uh, regulations and laws. In other countries, for example, China socialist, people don't have a choice. The government tells them what to do, they do it. Here we have a lot more freedom, but we also have to understand why these uh, regulations are in place. So right now, because remember, we have no cure, no testing. Um, the, the only way we're gonna control this pandemic is, um, I'm sorry, we have no cure and no treatment. The only way to really um, control this pandemic is testing and contact tracing. That's really the only way we can do that, as well as distance mitigations like distance, uh, social distancing, okay? So those are our only strategies. Public health structures help us do that. Um, of course, we don't have as, as, as well a public health structure here in the United States as we used to have um, or as we should have. So that's why we're seeing some problems. Um, and, and remember, right now we don't have enough tests to test everybody. So what's going on now is testing really for those people that have symptoms and that have uh, potential disease. So we call that uh, more, um, uh, instead of surveillance testing where everybody gets testing, we're just sort of dealing with uh, people um, uh, who are ill. Because we also know, because we don't have any treatments uh, for this disease, um, if a person becomes uh, very ill, they usually have to go into the hospital and have um, uh, equipment at the hospital, like ventilators, et cetera, to assist them and keep, to keep them alive. So those are some of the other reasons why some other countries, I always give the example, uh, uh, South Korea and Italy had uh, around the same time they started having their pandemic hit their countries. But South Korea has a lot more um, uh, um, intensive care beds, even more than the United States. So that kind of helps, helps them with mitigating uh, people dying. Um, they also were able to, their leadership was able to do much more uh, and very quickly mitigation strategies like social distancing, uh, quarantines, shelter at home, uh, stopping uh, people coming in and out of the country, uh, those kind of um, tactics uh, compared to Italy. Italy also has a much older population. One of the things we're realizing is that COVID-19 probably uh, has much more of an effect on, on certain populations like the elderly. So over 60, 65 uh, age. Um, it also has effects on people who have uh, conditions, um, certain chronic health conditions. Um, so that brings me to my next uh, topic about, you've been hearing lately probably that um, this disease is affecting African Americans or, or black communities here in the U.S. much more uh, frequently than white populations. Dr. Fauci, many of you know, is the um, head of the National Institutes of Health um, uh, Institute that deals with infectious diseases. And he says the coronavirus is, a shiny, is shining a bright light on unacceptable health disparities for African Americans. He said that on April 7th at one of the coronavirus briefings. So what does he mean? What does that mean? Uh, I love this quote, uh, when, when white folks catch a cold, black folks get pneumonia. So it just means that, you know, um, we are always um, um, at a critical um, stage when it comes to our health. We have worse health outcomes in most chronic diseases like uh, diabetes, like heart disease, like stroke, like cancer, like HIV, infant mortality, maternal mortality, the list goes on and on and on. Uh, of course, more blacks are, are, are poor and uninsured, uh, which means we cannot get into the healthcare system easily. Uh, we also think that there are confusing public health uh, messages. People are really not just understanding the seriousness of the problem due to myths. Uh, there were some myths that said blacks didn't get the disease, only old people get the disease. That's not true. Anybody can get the disease, but of course, some groups are more at risk for dying of this disease. And even if you get it and have mild symptoms, which 
of people do, they are still potential spreaders of the disease. So we have to pay attention and really understand what this uh, all means. The last thing I'm, I'm gonna talk about is um, there is medical distrust of the medical system. There's a historical mistrust of uh, the medical system by blacks, and that's rightfully so. We all know about the Tuskegee syphilis experiment, which started in 1932 right here in Alabama where I'm taping from, um, but ended in 1972. 40 years that study went on. It is the longest non-therapeutic clinical trial in U.S. history, and it is a symbol of really the abuse of medicine against uh, certain populations, uh, including black folks. So I always tell my students, uh, being black in America, you should have a, a little bit of a distrust, uh, paranoia, uh, being black uh, in this uh, society. Um, but you also wanna balance that with good public health information and information that's gonna help you and your community. Uh, along with that distrust, there are a lot of conspiracy theories People spend a lot of time spinning wheels on where did this come from? Uh, was it in a, made in a, a laboratory? Did it come from a country to target certain populations? I always say, who cares? It's here, let's deal with it. So uh, not to discount that, like I said, I'm not discounting those things, but we don't wanna spend so much time on that and not deal with the uh, really public health uh, issues. So now I'm gonna switch gears and talk a little bit about how should the church respond to this epidemic. Uh, particularly, I, I talk about, I do a lot of work in the black church. Black church is a very important institution historically for black communities. Um, so we know that people go to the church for leadership and are listening uh, very closely to the church on how it responds. So I'm coming from a paper that, um, that was out of the ethics and religious Liberty Commission. It was entitled, How the Church Can Respond to the Coronavirus. Um, it was written in March 12, 2020, led by Philip Bethencourt. And I know him as a, a very well-known uh, bioethicist um, in this country. So I'm um, taking some of their um, recommendations. First of all, should the church respond is the question. And I say yes. Uh, most churches have a theological mandate uh, as Christians, most of us uh, here in this country are Christians, but for every other religion, there is sort of a, um, a foundation that really talks about, and, and in Christian uh, theology, we talk about the Ten Commandments, love our neighbors as ourselves. Uh, churches should care then uh, based on that mandate for not only their congregate, congregants, but also the community. So first, churches should identify reliable local sources of information, get educated, educate the leadership and their members. Okay, so churches should identify reliable, uh, not just national sources, I'm gonna give you some websites at the end, uh, both national and international, but every state has a health department that has information on their websites. There's information available and you should get it, read it, uh, pastors, church leadership should get educated. They have, you have members in your congregation who can educate you. I've heard various stories of um, uh, congregational members who are healthcare providers who had conversations with their pastors to really get them to understand the whole idea of social distancing and really uh, stopping some of the activities that churches do, um, which would be important for the health, not only of their congregations, but uh, congregational members, but also communities. So get, gather that information. Secondly, churches should assess what they do, their practices. So that's from, uh, and we're gonna talk a little bit about this, church service, uh, the communion, uh, outreach ministries, all those things you do where you could put people at risk, make an assessment of those. Some churches have nurseries, all those things as well. Third, ch churches should always over communicate their plans. So you should constantly be reaching out to your congregations and to your members and to the community about what you're doing and why you're doing it and over communicating that over and over again, clearly, uh, clearly and um, overstating it. Can't overstate it enough. And then fourth, churches should really be encouraging uh, their people. This, these are trying times for members as well as uh, community members and the church is the place where they should receive that encouragement, I think. Uh, just some practical tips. 
First, cleaning and sanitation. Um, we know that um, I've been hearing all kinds of stories about what things work to uh, really uh, disinfect this virus. Sanitizers do work, certain amount of alcohol, I think 60% uh, alcohol content. Bleach uh, also works, but those are the main things. People are mixing up all kinds of concoctions, um, but just really keep, keep it um, simple. Um, the thought of maybe, um, even when we are uh, free of the shelter at home uh, regulations, thinking about automatic uh, sanitation dispensers at your church, uh, really some procedures for high traffic areas, um, how you collect uh, baptism plates and keeping those sanitized, and really thinking about nursery and children areas as important areas to keep clean and sanitized. I know that happens a lot anyway, but really uh, rethinking what we do and what our processes are. Worship services and church practices, of course, how we do baptism, because of course we're passing um, uh, materials where people could get infected um, uh, by passing those plates in, 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 the same, in the same way the collection plate. Some uh, churches might think about, instead of doing a collection plate, uh, having people come to one a site to collect, and I'm going to get into a little bit about online giving as another process as well. Some churches have been doing drive-by um, uh, um, giving, which is great, um, but also keeping uh, uh, keeping in thought sanitation processes. Um, that that idea I said of a central offering area rather than passing the plate. Um, all church services, of course, and events. Um, most of us. Uh, throughout the country have had to uh, cancel church services, but also thinking when we reopen meals, how we do meals, um, how that could be a place of infection. Of course, how we handle funerals now, outreach ministries as well. Um, so we're moving now to more virtual services and a, a increased use of social media. And I'll talk a little bit more about which services might be best. In fact, that's coming up now. Uh, live streaming, churches are doing live streaming of their worship service that ser services that were filmed at the church and distributing it online. So more and more churches are having to use uh, technology. Um, it's very difficult for some rural areas where they may not have um, online availability, but um, thinking about how to get it, um, uh, especially, especially in times like this. Um, filming and distributed a recorded sermon, just like we're recording now. And uh, some are even adding a discussion guide for families to add to their services, are recording worship songs, of course, providing links to recordings of worship. And some, some uh, as well as with services, are doing online prayer meetings through Skype, Google Hangouts, or Zoom. Okay, so those are some great things. You have to get creative, even with, I've seen some creativity with funeral services, uh, different tape messages to really piece together for people to have the service through Zoom, Facebook Live, um, et cetera. So those are, are technologies. And, you know, uh, it may be difficult. You might have to find someone in your church. Some of, some of the churches were already doing this. For example, my church had already begun to do an online uh, giving uh, through an app called GiveLify which was great for me because I, when I travel a lot and could not be at church service, I could always give my tithe. Um, more, more and more churches should think about that as, an, as a uh, service, um, particularly in times like this. I know there had, there had been some churches before who had ATM machines and things like that, um, but thinking of different ways uh, using technology to keep people engaged uh, because as, as we know, churches are small businesses and they need the uh, income. Uh, over communicating with your church. So constantly reassuring your congregation. So some of this means that uh, we have to, uh, my church uses text me text messaging. Some churches do more online uh, listservs and really thinking about how to do that efficiently more and more to really keep your congregation um, engaged, reassuring them, reminding them about their own personal prevention, which means high, um, uh, sanitation um, and also uh, social distancing. Um, urging high-risk um, uh, individuals of your congregation to stay home, uh, 
and urging members to follow those home shelter rules. So those who are elderly, checking up on them. Uh, we have other congregational members who are who are younger, who might be um, who might be shopping, going shopping, because of course the the, the at home sheltering is important so that you don't increase your risk by going out. Um, um, so uh, those younger people can do that. You, you're wearing your mask, um, wearing gloves when, when necessary if you're gonna be in high risk areas. But I, I think the mask is important uh, so you don't touch your face, your chances of you infecting yourself. And then also for people who cough or might have some symptoms so that they don't pass it on to everybody. Washing, washing hands. Um, it, uh, wherever you go, if you, for example, go to the uh, grocery store to uh, sanitize, they give us, uh, give me sanitizers every time I go to the grocery store, sanitizing down that cart, and then when I come out, um, definitely using sanitizer and washing hands. So really urging our, our members to, to really um, use those uh, personal protection uh, uh, prevention strategies and really directing your um, uh, churches and church members uh, to trusted professional information sites. So CDC is a trusted site, www.cdc.gov. WHO is a trusted site, uh, uh, regardless of what President Trump may say. Uh, www.who, uh, World Health Organization, .int, and then also your local and state um, health departments. Um, as well. And there are many other organizations, uh, community-based organizations that have things on their website. So other vehicles of communication. I'm, I'm, I'm really urging this for church leadership uh, to do regular updates. So you have a, every week you had a uh, uh, church bulletin, make it an e-bulletin. Send it by email, church-wide, or you can do a church-wide email or text message, as I mentioned before with my church. Uh, emails to leaders, so the leadership should really stay in contact. Emails to parents to keep help them keep encouraged as they have their kids at home, uh, teaching them. Very stressful. I think we're going to have another uh, series on managing your stress during this epidemic. Weekly newsletter uh, is a good idea for what the church might be doing. For example, my church is still doing outreach, uh, food um, outreach, so uh, newsletters to really kind of you know, keep the congregational members are praise of that and also community leaders as well. There, and and uh, processes, remember going back to what I was talking about with church processes, how you uh, keep yourself safe as well as community members safe while you're doing those uh, uh, outreach ministries. Some, some churches do uh, communion to those who are bedridden, so really investigating how you do those procedures and making sure you're safe. Uh, some some pastors are still doing their sermon from the pulpit and then recording it. Sunday announcement slides um, you can send out. Social media, of course, we've talked about Facebook, Facebook Live, uh, websites. Most most churches have websites, so keeping um, updates on COVID nineteen, what's going on in your area. For example, our mayor has been doing town hall. A meetings, you can maybe do a link to uh, what's going on in your town or in your state. If you have missionaries from the churches giving, getting updates from them on, on where they, how COVID-19 is affecting them. Flyers to encourage people to wash their hands. I, I also uh, say how to make masks. So the other thing is some people are having difficulties finding masks or buying masks. Uh, people can make their own. So I've seen on the CDC website actually how to make your own mask. I saw um, how to do it in my local paper. Um, so just Googling and, and making your own mask is a great project even for kids to do or for churches to do as well and outreach uh, to the community. There's some groups that are doing that for hospitals, etc. And then video updates. You can also, uh, pastors and leaders can do tapes and send that out to congregational members. So I just close with this quote. Therefore, I encourage uh, therefore, encourage one another and build up one another, just as you are doing. That's First Thessalonians 5, 11. May God continue to bless you and keep you.